There you go. Nice two core cable that will now not wiggle around and stuff. It's a lot easier to handle. And it's still just about long enough. You have to make it a bit longer because of course you lose a bit of length in when you do it. But anyway, that was that. I'm going to carry on now. So last week we brought you up to speed with the things that have been going on. Showed you our sound insulation, showed you all the jobs that we didn't manage to do and made a start on the lighting. This week the lighting's not finished and I haven't got much to show you but I did wash the mooring lines so I thought I'd tell you how we have our mooring lines set up and why we do it the way we do it. Hello will you? So um, for those of you who have been following our channel we just finished the varnishing, just done the soundproofing on the engine and we're doing the wiring on the electrics. Putting some new lights in the headliner and putting a new headliner, but that's taken a bit of time. So I've just washed these and I thought I'd show you what's here and do a bit of talk about them because these are our mooring lines. <coughs> and plenty of people in the single-handed, sailing single-handed film we did seem to be concerned about picking up the mooring lines. And I can understand that. It is probably the worst part of the whole sailing single-handed is knowing you can get back on your boy. Um, but one of the advantages of having your own mooring is it means you can have your own mooring lines. So put your own lines on the boy permanently so they're always there so you haven't got to worry about trying to you know, hook it and slide a rope through it and make them the ropes that you want to be picking up. So I thought I'd show you what mine are. So the first thing is, I've got them washed. I've shown this before but this is my net bag, very big, bought from eBay, £1.65, delivered from China. And it's great. You put your lines in there. <coughs> These are my mooring ropes. These were sitting in the River Medway for a year and were properly green. But I put them in that bag, put them in the washing machine on what we have as a delicate wash. But I, no real reason for it being delicate, a delicate wash other than it doesn't spin it too fast, doesn't last too long so that I'm not wasting loads of power and water and stuff. Um, put normal clothing detergent in there. One of these little sachets that has the conditioner and everything already in it. And they come out like that, like new. Um, so anyway, yeah, mooring lines. So these are my mooring lines. They're made out of, uh, I think this is 16 millimeter, uh, five eighths for you American types. Um, nylon three strand mooring rope. Now you want nylon for a couple of reasons. The first is that it's got a bit of spring in it so that as your boy is bouncing around on the, bo the uh, sorry as your boat's bouncing around on the river and the boy is straining it this will take a damp a little bit of that out but the most important reason is it sinks and that does sound a little bit counterintuitive doesn't it when you're say you're single-handed but bear with me on this. The reason you want it to sink is that when you leave your mooring the ropes go under the water and then if anyone else is passing and not paying any attention they're not likely to run over your mooring lines and get wrapped around a prep prop because it wouldn't be any good for them and it wouldn't be any good for you would it because you'd come back and wouldn't have any lines left on your boy so they sink which means they get them out of the way um, <clears throat> but when you're sailing single-handed there's a way around that problem because i go out to the boat in a dinghy i've got to do something with a dinghy well i don't just tie it onto the boy i tie it onto the end of one of my mooring lines, which I all both my mooring lines have eyes into, and I'll come to that reason for that in a minute. I tie it onto the end of the one of my mooring lines, so it trails out behind, yeah, from the buoy when I go. So when I come back, I've got the length of the mooring line plus the length of the painter on the dinghy, which is deliberately made sort of an oversized painter for a dinghy, but so that I can grab that. It's, you know, effectively the dinghy then becomes a buoy on the end of a big floating rope, so it's easy to reach. It gives me a huge window of error when I approach the buoy. I can snag the rope that's on the dinghy, which is on the mooring line, heave it all on deck, and then hook my eye, which is spliced in the end, straight over a cleat. So it makes it really easy to pick up. <coughs> so yeah, nylon lines. Um, and don't make them too big. There's a real temptation because if you leave your boat for weeks, even months on end, you want to you want to be confident when you come back to your boat, it's still there. Um, so it's easy to get convince yourself that what you really want is a you know 
I've got 16 mil ropes, it'd be easy for me to say, well, why don't I get three quarter or even an inch? And then I know it's going to be okay. Well, the reason you don't want to do that is because you, the, the, the right size rope for your boat has probably been worked out by the, the builder. And they'll have fitted deck cleats and deck hardware and fair leads and bow rollers and all that sort of thing to suit that size of boat. If you get a piece of rope that's bigger than you really need on your boat, when you come to wrap it around the cleat, you probably only get a turn and a half, and that's no good, is it? So the rope might not fail, but it's no good if you can't tie it onto the boat. So, you know, clearly it needs to be thick enough, um, but don't need to be thicker. Seahorse is 29 foot long. Um, I don't know what her displacement is, but she's not that heavy. She's, um, you know, a modern, fairly lightweight, performance-ish sort of build. Um, she's not a heavy old traditional sort of boat. So. You know, I've got, like I say, 16mm 5 eighths. I don't know what your boat is, but you know, it's more than enough for us. Modern ropes are far stronger than they need to be. The only reason it even needs to be this thick is because it's going to be on the river for years potentially. You're going to get UV degrading it. It might rub or chafe. Um, I want to know there's plenty of spare capacity in this to cope with all those things. But it doesn't need to be a 16mm rope. Um, yeah, from a pure strength point of view on a one-off. Anyway, let's get back to the lines. So I have two lines. I have a main, what I consider my main mooring line and what I consider to be my spare. And I attach both of these to the swivel that's on our mooring buoy. We're very lucky at Medway. The mooring buoy, the ground tackle, the swivel on top is all kind of serviced and maintained um, as part of our membership. I guess we're paying for that, but at least it's one thing to one thing less to worry about. Um, now plenty of people like to have a hard eye in the end of the spliced into the end of the mooring line and then use a shackle to connect it and that probably works okay. Um, I don't like it because it's one more thing that can go wrong um, and I see it as unnecessary. I like to have a small spliced eye, you can see that's only just big enough for the sort of two strands around to go through and what I do is I, I put that through the swivel and then thread the end of the line through it, I don't know what you call that kind of knot effectively where it goes through, but effectively it locks it onto the, the eye on the swivel like that. And for us that works brilliantly. And the, I, th I think the, and the reason that I do it like that, and the reason I think some people like to use a hard eye is because the one thing that's going to fail on really is chafe, isn't it? Um, the chafe only occurs if you've got kind of something sharp or something rubbing. Well, our swivel's a nice modern steel swivel and if I can stop it rubbing it's not going to chafe is it so this pulls around nice and tightly and pulls on tight and doesn't move it doesn't twist around it or whatever and you can see that's been on on the uh, the buoy for you know a year or so, a year and a bit or so and there's no you know there's no chafe on it at all um, so no that works for it and that's all I like and it's got a normal spliced eye on the end um, I'm not going to tell you how to splice there's plenty of YouTube films on how to splice, um, but it isn't that hard. Don't, don't, just because you haven't spliced a rope before, don't let it put you off, honestly. It really isn't that hard. Um, but, you know, watch a few shows. Do it on a new bit of rope first. Don't try doing it on a used rope, because what happens, this is getting pulled tighter and tighter when it's being used, and then trying to lift these tw turns to thread your rope underneath is just really hard work, certainly if you haven't done it before. Do it on new rope, it's nice and easy, it hasn't been pulled flat and stuff, it, it, it's not that hard. It's a bit it's a bit unnerving the first time you leave your boat on a, on a spliced eye you've done yourself, but yeah, honestly, unless you've made a really bad job by which it will be obvious, yeah. I, I would say if it looks like a splice, it's a splice and it'll work. Yeah, if it looks really bad, then maybe get a second opinion before you leave your boat hanging off it, but yeah, you'll be fine. So, um, so yeah, so both my lines, my, I have two lines, one what I consider my main mooring line, and one I consider my sort of safety, they both hook onto the swivel like this, which is the point actually, I, that's my, if my boat's ever going to float off down the river, I suspect it's going to be because of the swivel failing, um, or the eye on the buoy failing, and I don't know a way of putting a safety on a swivel so that as it's swiveling around it doesn't tie itself in knots. If anyone does, let us know, because um, that's the one point. But anyway, you've got to trust something. So I'm trusting the boy in the swivel. It's a big swivel. I mean, it's not going to just fail. 
and if I look after it and keep an eye on it, and as do the club, I don't suspect, you know, if that's going to fail, it'll be obvious it's going to fail for months or years even before it actually finally fails, so I'm not too worried. Anyway, let's get back to my mooring mooring line. That hooks onto my swivel, it comes up through my bow roller with this bit of rope, I'll come back to that, to, on the end, another spliced eye. My mooring lines have a spliced eye on both ends of both of them, and I'll explain that. So this one, is the, to start with, the rope is exactly the length I want it to be. So when that's now over the bow roller and hooked onto my deck cleat, it's exactly the length I want it to be. So I haven't got to worry about adjusting it. I, I, know, I know it's gonna fit straight away. Um, and that eye is just only just big enough to hook over my deck cleat. Yeah, you know, it's a real, you have to kind of hook that end on, pull it tight and then wiggle it to get it over. And I do that because then I know there's pretty much no chance that's going to bounce off inadvertently. Once it's on, it's on. So I can I hook that on my cleat and I know the boat's not going anywhere. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> so that's the right length. Going back to this bit of rope. Seahorse has got a fairly small bow roller. I suspect that's in part because she's been used for racing much of her life and previous owners probably don't want a big bow roller because it's all just weight and in part because Hansa 291s which Seahorse is were Hansa's first um, very first boats and they were building budget boats to get into the market and I guess big bow rollers cost big bucks and um, they, just, they just didn't want them so it's a small bow roller but I don't have a problem with that but back to that previous point of um, why things chafe this rope only really touches in three points. It touches the swivel down the bottom, comes up over the bow roller, which is this, and then it goes round that deck cleat. And the deck cleat's, because I've got this nice big eye, it's a nice modern, smoothed off um, cleat, it's not going to chafe at the cleat. I've just said it's not going to chafe on the buoy, so I tie it onto the bow roller, and that stops any movement there. It stops the rope jumping off, so if there's chop or whatever, there's, this isn't going to bounce off the bow roller, and it stops it moving around the stuff, so it eliminates chafe. Um, and this bit of rope is literally just a bit of modern multi-strand plait or whatever they call this modern rope threaded through, I've twisted the rope to open up the turns of the rope and just threaded it through and then just tied the knot so it's on and of course it's in the right place every time then I'm not going to lose it, when I leave the buoy I just untie it off the barrel and leave it threaded on the bit of rope like that and when I come back I know everything's in the place I want it to be it, it, you know, it hooks onto the cleat in the same place and that is always in the right place to just then tie it around the, the bow roller. So that makes it really simple. <coughs> Except when I come back to the mooring the first time, this isn't the rope I pick up. I pick up my spare rope, which is exactly the same. It's the same three strand rope, it's hooked onto the swivel in the same way. Except this one is like twice as long as my anchor rope and in the end I have a much bigger eye. So it's done like this for a couple of reasons. <coughs> First thing is it's twice as long so that it's twice as easy when I come back to the mooring if I go to grab this one I've got twice as much rope to play with so that um, if I'm a bit off on you know approaching the buoy I've overshot it or I'm off to one side I've got twice as much rope to, to reach it. And I've got an eye on the end because when you're scrabbling around, you've got a boat hook in your hand, you know, whatever. All I've got to do is hook that over one of the cleats. And like I say, this is a bigger eye, so it goes over the cleats easy, this one. Um, and then I'm on the mooring. And then I've got, once I'm hooked on, even if I'm not in the perfect place, um, it's, it's, uh, I'm safe. <coughs> so once I'm on, I then get the other rope, the main mooring rope, and I hook that on, tight onto the bow roller, and now I'm in the right place. I come back to the spare. And what I do is I leave this slightly loose, so it's not doing the main primary job, but it's on. And I just wrap it around the deck cleat like you would normally. I don't leave it on that eye because that'd be far too long. But I take it off the eye and I use it like a normal mooring line then and wrap it around the cleat. Um, and then I know it's on, it's safe, um, but the the main mooring line is doing the, the bulk of the work. And I like to keep it like that. A lot of people might have them um, both doing the same thing. I, as I said, that rope is more than strong enough to, to hold this boat. I haven't got to worry about strength and I like to kind of keep the roll separate so that this one really isn't going to wear or anything because there's no load on it, nothing's going to happen. So I don't have to worry about this one chafing. But the main one, the one I've got to worry about, I've only then really looking at one rope. I know how it's fitted, how it's the condition of it. And of course, I can. it's much easier to make one rope the right length than it is to try and make two ropes the right length. 
so it just suits us um, anyway that's it um, I'm gonna have to go there's things to do and then hopefully maybe this afternoon I can get back and uh, do a bit more work on the, the lighting and the electrics and stuff this has already taken twice as long as I planned it to take because I sat here and did all this talk first time and I hadn't switched the microphone on so you didn't hear any of it so I'm running out of patience for doing this film <laughs> anyway I'm Ian this is Sailing with the Foxhall family thanks for watching oh I mean egg's gone dead now <laughs> <laughs>